Hello, hi everybody. We are live with Cycling UK. I'm Anna and this is Bants Bikes and being female, I don't even know what episode we're on. I was just about to say it's episode blah 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 but I've lost count. We've basically, we've extended the series which is a series aimed at giving female cyclists all the information they need about starting cycling and continuing cycling and long may it continue. Um, it's a, been really hugely popular and so I've got to say thank you to the audience for that as well for making this part of your Friday lunchtime routine. It's obviously gained a little bit of a community and I'm really grateful for that so thanks to everybody for helping this continue and uh, this week's topic we're talking about the menopause and cycling. So this is something I've really got to look forward to. Yeah, can't wait. <laughs> um, so looking forward to getting Getting loads of information about that from our expert guests. Just a little reminder that the Women's Festival of Cycling is coming up in about two weeks' time, and this is super exciting. There's going to be loads of online activities going on um, and really celebrating women's cycling, and it's all a little bit creative, a little bit fun, and very informative. So just keep an eye on the Cycling UK website and Facebook page. That'd be really cool. All right, so without further ado, let's get going with today's guests. Um, let's introduce Susie onto the screen. Hi Anna, hi there. Hi Susie, how are you doing? Can you just let us know who you are? Yeah sure, so hi my name's um, Susie Unsworth so I'm a, a doctor with a specialist interest in women's health and particularly menopause and I've got extra training, I hold an advanced certificate in menopause care so hopefully I can offer some medical advice on any questions people might have or difficulties that they might be experiencing in relation to menopause. Um, I do run a clinic offering sort of specialist menopause advice, um, and hopefully I'll, I'll have something helpful to contribute to the talk today. I'm sure you will. Thanks so much for being with us. And we've also got Jessie with us today. Hi, um, I'm Jessie Lambert-Hard, and I'm the Fuel Coach on an app called Her Spirit, which provides um, information and is a community-led app um, Mel, who's on in a minute, will tell you a bit more about that. Um, my approach is very sort of practical, uh, evidence-based, um, but giving women um, and educating women on how you can fuel and uh, your body and support the changes as we age, not just through menopause, but how we how our body changes and how we can ad adapt our lifestyle using body sort of. Uh, exercise, fuel, and changing mindset to support these changes. Brilliant, thank you. So let's introduce then your colleague as well. So we've got Mel joining us also from Her Spirit. Hey Mel. Yeah. Hey, I feel like it's the Eurovision Song Contest. So this is Mel from, uh, from Nottingham. And, Are you going to uh, sing? Go on. No, I don't want to subject anybody to that because I think it might be, you know, a bit too kind of harmful kind of for the Friday lunchtime. But yeah, like, just picking up on what Jessie says. So I'm one of the co-founders of Her Spirit. And our, our philosophy is around personalised coaching for your mind, body and fuel. We do that through an app, but we also do that, you know, pre-COVID, obviously, in its kind of physical sense. But hopefully what I can kind of bring to the, the table is I'm not academic like Susie and Jessie are, but as a woman that cycles a lot, I've gone through my own kind of menopausal journey and hopefully I can make, you know, a lot of that kind of relatable to a lot of people that are kind of listening today. So, yeah, hope you uh, enjoy today, everybody. Excellent, thanks. And um, let's introduce Leslie on as well. So we've got Leslie with us today. Hi, everybody. Hi, Anna. Hey, yeah. Uh, Hi, how are you? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Thanks for joining us and squeezing it in because I know you've got a busy day. Yeah. So we will Thank keep this you. to its 45 so minutes. I'm, why don't you let yeah. people know who you are? Okay, so I'm um, a lifelong um, athlete and particularly cyclist. Um, my expertise field is nutrition and homeopathy. And uh, as you know, Anna, I uh, took off in my menopause and cycled across to Africa. Um, so everything's achievable at every stage of life if you want to make it happen. Excellent. I love, I just, yeah, really so pleased to get you on this panel today because of that incredible story of yours, which I think is going to give, well, it gives, it really inspires people like me who haven't hit that stage in my life yet to know that it's not going to be the end of everything. And that actually the adventures that you've had are things that yeah, I've got to look forward to. It's super, think, super brilliant. Yeah, I think we should turn it on its head. And really, it's the beginning of everything when you get to the mm -hmm. menopause, because it's that next phase of life that's so exciting and you've got nothing to lose. 
Love it. Ah, so good, so good. And finally, uh, to join us, we've got Emily from perimenopause. So Emily, I've never even heard the word perimenopause, so I came across it when I was doing the research for this. So tell us a bit about you and, and the work that you do with that. So um, in, in relevance to cycling, I started doing triathlons and I sort of took up cycling in my 30s. And then um, when I hit 39, I just hit this wall of fatigue and all sorts of things that just weren't right. And um, it took about three and a half years then backwards and forwards to the doctor. And eventually we agreed that it was probably perimenopause, by which point I had learnt the word perimenopause. And if you look up the dictionary definition, which really annoys me, by the way, um, perimenopause <laughs> is the period in a woman's life shortly before the menopause. And the menopause, as Susie will hopefully <laughs> it's kind of um, defined a year after you've finished having periods, but kind of backdated to that time. So it's effectively a day. And so the fact that perimenopause is this short period beforehand, but, but can last sort of 10 to 12 years, sort of annoys me a little bit. So I, so I set up the hub and brought together experts in all sorts of different fields to help women in their late 30s and 40s who really don't know what's hit them because they're expecting menopause to happen in their 50s and suddenly this all starts hitting them way earlier than that so that's why I set it up. And um, so um, maybe between you and Susie you might be able to explain a bit more about that process from where you've got this one day where you are officially in the menopause stage and um, so what is this transition period how does it work no puns intended Log. you probably get that all the time oh, I thought I'd be really original <laughs> <laughs> shall I shall I try yeah. and go through it so, easy. so what Emily said is, is is spot on. So the menopause is actually a definition of the end of your period essentially and it's made retrospectively. So it can only be made twelve months down the line. But then the actual menopause was the time of your very last period. Um however, most women probably start to experience a lot of symptoms prior to that. And that is what we call the perimenopause, so the build-up to that, that particular time when your period stops. But that can range in duration from anything from maybe just a few months to actually years. And I think a lot of women don't recognise that. And I think a lot of medical professionals, unfortunately, don't always recognise that as well. And so they think if women are still having periods, then it can't be anything to do with the menopause. But actually what is happening is in the build-up to the actual menopause, hormonal fluctuations start to occur quite significantly and um, you get this up and down roller coaster sort of pattern with the hormones and it's that that will often give women um, a, a big range of symptoms um, and um, that can be really really troublesome and often women don't necessarily recognize that that's what it is. Excellent. I'm just going to ask you to mute when you're not speaking. Give yourselves a mute because we're just getting a little bit of feedback. And we've got we've got a range of ages in this group as well. So some people have hit that menopause deadline. Some people are at the perimenopause, and some um, not there yet. So those of you who have, um, I'm trying to think, what's the correct word? Is it perimenopause? So I want to know about your enjoyment of cycling. Has perimenopause or menopause affected negatively? your enjoyment of cycling um so who has gone through that would like to answer let's go to you mel just don't get to unmute um so yeah i mean like, i think mine symptoms probably were very similar to emily's and as somebody who was very active so i was a swimmer by trade migrated to you know triathlon and doing half ironmans etc is I struggle to understand how I could go from feeling a million dollars to generally feeling on my knees. And, you know, I guess my attitude historically was the battering one of uh, it's a bad day. I'm going to be OK, you know, just kind of get over it and get on with it. And I would then, you know, exacerbate it by going, I feel really rubbish. What I'll do is I'll then go and drink too much wine because I feel grumpy that I haven't been able to kind of exercise and then again go, hmm, that seems to be getting kind of worse. It, and then realizing that it wasn't a moment in time, it was it was months in time. And then having to stop and A, accept that my body was kind of changing from somebody who had been very fortunate to be very kind of active. 
And then as we have as our one of our core philosophies, and I know Jessie will kind of, you know, hopefully nod her head, it's around stopping and reflecting and, and diarising. So I started to diarise and I started to go, well, why do I feel like I do? And, you know, without going into kind of much detail, and for us at Her Spirit, we have what's called a seven-day reflect diary that we ask women to do is, they were simple is, is when I was having too much sugar, when I was having too much caffeine, when I was having too much kind of alcohol, that had a real detrimental effect to my energy levels. And, and by doing that, when I actually got to the GP and they went, right, well, you know, you're obviously kind of in that. And I was definitely, you know, I was still menstruating and it's like, it's not me. But yeah, look, you know, it's that that was kind of my journey. And, and I now know how to manage that. And I love riding my bike and picking up on, you know, Leslie's comments kind of earlier is you can continue to do anything and everything you truly want to. But it's about choices and it's about understanding and reflecting and kind of making the the appropriate um, changes. So, yeah, still love bike riding and will continue to love bike riding. It's good to hear. And we're going to come to more of those sort of solutions and tips and advice on how to manage it a little bit later on. And so we really will go into depth with that thanks for bringing it up um anybody else who wants to talk about any sort of negative experiences maybe specifically about how symptoms made you feel and how then you wouldn't want enjoy your cycling in the same way that you had before go for it emily um quite similar to mel um so about five months before i first went to the doctor with all the sort of symptoms and stuff i was on the start line of barcelona ironman i was the fittest i'd ever been i was just Woo, life is great, you know. And then five months later, I just didn't even recognize myself. But because the um, message we always hear is that all exercise is good, I felt that I must keep exercising because that must be something that's going to help, you know. And I mustn't, I must be being lazy and I must be being, I don't know, just all those negative things that you think when you're in this bad place and you don't know why. Um, and I carried on and carried on. And, um, the the sort of the the big smack in the face, I guess, was um, Holcomb Half Iron Man three years ago. Um, and whilst I've never been a speedy cyclist, I couldn't hold twelve miles an hour on the bike leg. I just simply couldn't. But that's what I had to get to hit the run cut off, and I couldn't hold it because my body was just depleted of everything. But because I still didn't know that this whole perimenopause thing exists even, and at the time I was 41, it didn't occur to me that I thought this was me being rubbish and being a, a useless cyclist and being a bad person and all those all those lovely things that we tell ourselves. Um, and it's only, it was probably about another year later that when I was working with a nutritionist and we did a load of tests and blah, 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 that I finally realised that actually I had been trying to push through something that my body really was not wanting me to do um so now another couple of years on from that I cycle never to a time never to a pace never to anything like that I cycle just to go out and see um the local area and to enjoy it and I hope that the time will come when I can build back up to longer distances but you know my body will tell me I'm so glad you brought that up because I think right now we're going to be talking to an audience that is used to being active. I'll come to Leslie as well because we are uh, cyclists that are going to be active people. We've discovered the joy of it already. We know we're always told that exercise is good for you and we're used to that. We know that often after a bad day when you feel tired, actually getting yourself out the door and onto the bike makes you feel better. And I'm sure... and. Um, We'll explore a little bit later on how when you can get out on the bike, it will make you feel better through the menopause. But it's not always the case, especially if you're used to being active. Maybe trying to force yourself to keep doing sport is not what your body's asking of you. Um, Leslie, you had something that you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the, the biggest thing I realised was that I couldn't get away with the indiscrepancies in my diet or drinking too much as I got older. You know, things I could have got away with as a teenager or a younger athlete. I think once I hit that sort of, for me, sort of like late 40s, um, I couldn't get away with it. I had to listen to my body and, um, you know, clean up my diet, clean up my act. But also kind of um, 
you know, look at balance and reflect on what was important in my life and was it important to go and kill this time trial in this amount of time or would I have more fun doing something completely different? So and that was me. It really was about, you know, looking at my life and, and making those choices. How did I want to spend the next few years? You know, did I want to put myself on a hiding to nothing <laughs> or, you know, was there a way of getting a better quality of life? Yeah, it's interesting you've all sort of mentioned diet and stuff, so we were definitely going to go into that in a big way a little bit later on because it seems to be a huge theme here. And, you know, and um, cutting down on alcohol as well. I think throughout any woman's life, you go through these little phases, don't you? Like, I'm in my 30s now, and I'm I'm waking up to the fact that I can't get away with hangovers anymore, like a kid in my early 20s. And I guess, you, you know, you hit these little these parts in your life where you have to reassess and think about things a little bit more. Jesse, yeah, you had something you wanted to say? So just going to offer a different perspective. Um, I don't actually cycle competitively, never have. Um, I, I cycle for, for fun more than anything else. Um, but I'm sort of at that age where things have started to change. And so from uh, me to you, Anna, I guess, because um, I'm just early 40s. And when I was when I was younger, what I started doing was tracking my periods, but not just sort of blood flow, flow but it was, um, and this is what I do with all my clients, is uh, symptom, all your symptoms that you can't, that come with your periods. So everyone's like, you know, the week before I'm due on, I feel absolutely awful, you know, and every month they'll say the same thing. And, you know, without noting these things down all the time. And then when you get to a phase where I am now and things start to get a little bit different, things start to change, these symptoms start to change. Um, then you've got sort of, then you feel empowered to go, all oh, right, this is me changing. This is me getting that little bit older. Maybe I'm now moving into that phase of my life and it's something that you can go to the doctor with or you can start to adapt both um, the exercise, the nutrition and your mindset. So you can say, right, this is me going forward. This is me changing. Um, and for me, like, it's been more to do with mood than anything else right now. Like, very, very strong, angry, sort of <laughs> behave erratic behaviours. And, uh, the, yeah, and so to know that that's, that's what's causing it, we, uh, rather than anything like depression, I think that has actually been... It hasn't affected my exercise yet, but it affected my um, feelings around wanting to exercise or motivation. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Do you know, something I'm picking up from these panel discussions repeatedly is that I need to really start journaling properly because I get the same thing. Like each month I'm like, oh, it's the end of the world. Everything's terrible. And then I'm like, oh, no, it was, it was just my period. <laughs> but yeah, Susie, yeah, what do you want to say there? I just wanted to pick up on something that Jesse just sort of alluded to. And it's to really to do with a lot of the psychological symptoms that can occur around the time, particularly of the perimenopause. Um, and depression and anxiety and mood changes are actually really, really common. And I think sadly, often get misdiagnosed as an actual mental health problem and then often get mistreated in that way. Um, and I think women who've never really experienced any anxiety or depression or mood changes like this and it suddenly starts to develop in their sort of mid to late 40s you really do have to be thinking about menopause as being a, a trigger for that and I sadly do see lots of women that have been prescribed antidepressants for this which is not really the right way to treat it well it's not the right way to treat it at all um, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of women don't recognize that the psychological symptoms can be really quite significant um, and if you're not getting things like the standard hot flushes which a lot of people associate with menopause then thinking that it's the menopause it's not often top of people's sort of list of what could be causing it um, yeah. so to make people aware that these symptoms are actually really common um, and but there are things you can do to help them but not necessarily rushing to be given an antidepressant yeah thanks for that and I'm going to I'm just going to hear what Emily wants to say and then I'll come back to you to talk a little bit more about other symptoms as well yeah Emily um it was just picking up on something that Jesse said about tracking your cycle I so I genuinely think, and I think anybody watching this who has a daughter should be encouraging her to start tracking her periods, whatever age she is, because honestly, 
that is the massive superpower that we have as women is understanding when we're going to have an epic week and when we're going to have an awful week and knowing how to manage our life. It's there. It's in our hormones. It's something that we live with. And exactly as you said, Anna, sometimes we just go, oh, God, the world's over. Oh, oh, there's my period. <laughs> and actually, if if from like late teens onwards, all women can start tracking. There's so many apps. It's so easy to do nowadays. Then A, we can start knowing when we could say yes to like a big project at work, when we sign up to the long distance cycling, when we say, do you know what, that week, I'm just going to stay under the duvet. And do you know what, that's fine. But actually, that is such a superpower that we have. And I just, I honestly think that all women should be tracking. Anyway, that's all. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. It's, um, yeah, start tracking. And is it such a strange thing to do anyway? You know, lo loads of cyclists listening to this will have training plans, diet plans, uh, financial plans of what they can buy, the things for their bikes and everything. They'll be training towards goals. Is it such a weird thing as well to introduce diaring, diarising? That got that from you, Mel, um, about a period. So, okay, Mel, really quickly, so I'm gonna, I want yeah, to something else. About conversation. So we have a podcast series that's hosted by Louise Minchin and Annie Emerson, and a lot of that conversation um, is and has um, peri and menopause and it's simplicity that it normalizes it. So from, you know, Lorraine Candy, who's the editor in chief at Stylist Magazine that then said, oh my God, I thought I was going nuts and I thought I was, you know, going down the, you know, the, the antidepressants kind of stages. We have to talk about and we have to raise this conversation. That's why, you know, conversations like this is kind of so vitally important. So yeah, look, be inspired. And if you want to listen to our podcast series, it really normalizes this conversation for so many women. Cool. We'll get that in the comments at some point. Maybe um, Nick can source that in a sec. It's on the Her Spirit website, is it? So we'll try and get that into the comments, which is good because it's true. People aren't talking about the menopause. And actually, we're going down into more and more niche topics through this series. And this is the one time where I found it really difficult to find women who are willing and open to talk about this subject. It's almost like the biggest taboo in today's society. You know, we've talked about periods, we've talked about breastfeeding, um, but menopause is seems to be the one still that people don't want to be talking about. So we're doing it here today. Thank you. Thanks again to the amazing guests for joining us. And and to the audience as well, if you want to put some stuff in the comments, I see that you're um, commenting already and you've got questions, we'll try and answer them and just share your experiences and talk about it because that's what we're doing right now. Um, Susie, could you, I did a little bit of, um, I've made a little bit of a list, but could you off the top of your head list some of the symptoms that can be associated with menopause and perimenopause? Yeah, sure. So I kind of divide it into different sort of categories. So the first category that most people are probably aware of are what we call vasomotor symptoms. And these are the hot flushes and night sweats. Um, so these can occur in the perimenopause and postmenopause, but they actually only affect 70% of women. So 30% of women won't actually get them at all. And so lack of those does not mean that it's not um, that you, the symptoms you're experiencing are, are menopausal. Um, the next thing um, I like to move on to are the psychological symptoms. So we spoke about anxiety and depression as being quite a, a common um, feature, but any sort of mood change, people feeling that they're just not themselves, they feel sort of less motivated to do things, um, they have memory problems, so memory is really difficult, you often hear people talk about this sort of brain fog, I think that's a, a classical sort of description of it, um, and so that's something that's often um, women are really affected by, and that can be really significant at this time of, of a woman's life, because often they're at their kind of peak of doing things you know by the time you get to your 40s and um, 50s you know you've achieved lots of things in your life and and suddenly you're hit with all these things symptoms that really impact on your ability to do things that a few years before you'd be able to do absolutely fine but then there are also physical symptoms so joint pains are very common um aching in the hands the feet but just sort of any of the joints can be affected the skin can be affected so it can be feel very dry sometimes people talk about this feeling of like a crawling sensation on their skin um and then vaginal symptoms i mean this is something that i feel really strongly about that i know we were saying women often don't want to talk about menopause 
women often really don't want to talk about any vaginal symptoms that they're having. And I think for women that do a lot of cycling, particularly, you know, this can actually be a real problem. Um, you can get a lot of dryness, soreness and um, pain when you're having sex, but also discharge problems. All these things are really common around the, the menopause and they're actually really easily treated. Um, so these are all the things that we really want to get people talking about more so that we can we can help with them. And then the period changes. So obviously the definition of menopause is to do with your, with your cycle and periods can do all sorts of funny things around the time of the perimenopause. They can get closer together. They can get more spaced out. Um, there are some things that we worry about a bit more. So if you get bleeding in between your periods or bleeding after sex, then we get more anxious that, that could have other causes for that. Um, but on the whole, periods can become quite irregular, which, again, if you're working to some sort of training schedule and something like that can be quite, quite troublesome. Um, I think there's there's well over 40 symptoms, actually, that could be um, related to menopause. But I would say that's kind of the, a summary of, of what I, I generally see in the women that I see. That's super helpful, actually. It's much more um, concise and clear than the list that I've made. So thanks for that. And actually, I'm going to if you can guide me on this, I'd like to use those categories that you've just um, talked about with our panelists here and talk about how those if you know, if you've experienced those symptoms um, and how they've specifically affected your cycling life and maybe what you've done to alleviate them. So uh, what was the first category? So I, I sort of spoke about vasomotor symptoms, which are the hot flushes and night sweats, which I think what most people probably first associate with with menopause. Yeah, it's, it's the typical one, isn't it? Yeah. The classic. So um, out of the panellists here, did any of you experience or have you or are you? Yeah, Leslie, what about and how has it affected you cycling specifically? Yeah, so what I found is that I really struggled with the kind of lycra and I needed to wear more natural fabrics and made it much easier to deal with. So I bought some like the merino wool top tops. And again, with the cycling shorts, I found that um, I needed to, to um, not keep them on too long. So I would literally put them on just before I went out the door and then um, remove them as soon as I got home. And that really helps. Sitting around in them definitely didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. This is exactly the sorts of tips that we're looking for today. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else about the hot flushes and cycling? Emily? Um, mine's more about the night sweats than the hot flushes, but when you're having the night sweats and they interrupt your sleep, if you're already dealing with fatigue, then obviously wanting to get out and cycle can be quite difficult. And I know when we get on to the sort of the food and the dietary changes that we will cover that off. So I'm not going to go in any more detail there. I'm just going to say that the night sweats can be a really big um, interrupter of sleep. So obviously they can then impact on energy. And your cycling energy the next day. OK, cool. And the next category, Susie? I feel like we're in some sort of game show now. It's like, <laughs> the category is? So, I mean, there was, the next thing I thought about was psychological symptoms. So this is to do with mood changes and anxiety um, and memory problems and that sort of thing. And this is huge for cycling because uh, one of the a huge barriers stopping women from cycling and why there's such a big gender gap can be to do with perceived fear, anxiety, fear of joining all male groups and cycling clubs and things like that. So it's only going to be exacerbated if you're having these hormonal changes that are making you feel more anxious. So, again, back to the panellists. Anybody got personal experiences of this in cycling? Yep, Jesse. Oh, you so again, not specifically in cycling, um, but just in exercise overall in general. I think um, motivation to do it, you know, obviously someone who who has a habit of um, exercising because that's, you know, it's something I do to make me feel good. It sort of made, it sort of exacerbated that even more. And uh, I actually visited the doctor and just made a really simple change and had, um, uh, estrogen uh, and estrogen gel which are just rub on um, like half a teaspoon and it's worked magic to be fair um, it's changed it really made me to turn from a bit of a psychopath into something uh, yeah it, it has changed my life really I may be this may be completely biased opinion but you know it worked so and I thought I was too young for any of this so 
Yeah, well, it's good then to have that experience so anyone listening to this who is younger can know, well, that's maybe something to start looking towards. And I'm sure um, you'll all, all agree as well, everyone's different. So what I've been reading about this, everyone experiences things differently, which is why it's great to have such a big and varied group, because we can share different experiences that different members of the audience will be able to relate to. Leslie, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say my experience was completely different and that sort of coming to the menopause for me was really liberating and I felt really I didn't care what other people thought anymore and it didn't matter if I was last and I found it took a lot of pressure off me and I was really you know wanted to make the most of every opportunity and it didn't matter what anybody else thought. Wow. So, yeah I found it a really great liberating experience. <laughs> Oh, fingers crossed! I get that one. Yeah. <laughs> I wish no, I mean, we all we all experience things very differently. You know, yeah. Like shorts. You might as well get on with it. What is everyone here doing? Yeah, Mel, go for it. Yeah, just pick up on the point around so many people are different and looking at some of the, you know, the comments that are coming in and that really kind of resonates with the thing. And what myself, Jesse, and we work with a, a great GP called Dr. Nigger Arif um, around, you know, a lot of the things, Susie, you've kind of touched on is simple bit of fun to start with to raise the conversation, which we called our menopause bingo. And it's, it's picked up on Louise's podcast with Joe Wiley that then says she sits there with her mates and they pay it and there's 36 symptoms. What we're hoping from that is getting people to go, oh, right, yeah, I've got 10 of those. And am I actually on the start of that journey? And what we believe and we hope that that starts to do is bring a conversation into people's, you know, home in a, in a fun, non-taboo kind of way. Because, you know, it's like, oh, my God, I've got 11 of those now rather than 10. So, look, you know, that's hopefully something that we help to, to do to raise that one. Cool. Yeah. Emily? And I think... Exactly that. The more we talk about it. So my worst symptoms were when I genuinely didn't have a clue what was going on in my body because I thought I was too young for this. I wasn't being taken seriously by the doctors, yada, yada, yada. And once I had that term, the liberating feeling that Leslie talked about, 100%, I'm like, oh, what? So I don't have to be defined by being fertile anymore. I can be defined by just being Emily. How amazing is that? Love it. That's so good. And there's somebody else in the comments, Katrina, as well, who's saying that she's agreeing with that comment, Emily, that Leslie started about menopause is very liberating, especially no longer having periods. And we did do a Bounce Bikes and Being Female episode all about cycling and periods and what a hassle they can be and bib shorts and changing when you're on a long ride and all that. So, yeah, I can definitely see some benefits there. OK, should we move on to one of the other categories? Uh, Susie, could you introduce that for us? Yeah, sure. So I guess the next thing that I spoke about was the actual physical symptoms that people get. So um, this is things like, I guess, joint pains, really common that people will talk about a lot more aching in all of their joints. And women often say to me that they feel like they've aged suddenly. They feel like an older woman because of the aching that they've suddenly developed. But other things can affect the skin. Um, headaches can be quite common, actually. And then one of the other physical symptoms that I do often hear women talk about are palpitations. So they can often be quite frightening if you've never experienced anything like that before. So there are lots of physical symptoms that people can get that can obviously impact on everyday functioning as well as other things like exercise and, and things like that. Yeah, obviously it's going to impact on everything. And if we keep it focused on cycling, it's so obvious that's going to it's not going to be nice if you're having joint pain and you're trying to exercise. The two, the two aren't really enjoyable. So again, back to the panelists. Like, what? Did any of you experience some of that physical pain or um, discomfort, and have it actually affect your cycling in a negative way? Mel, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you know, definitely picking up on that joint pain uh, for me is I, I definitely feel you know that classic kind of a bit stiffer. And I think you know, Susie, you talked about you feel like you've kind of aged, and it's you know it's head in hands when you say that, but. For me, it's the utter importance of continuing to do things like yoga, mobility, because we can still functionally do. And I guess, you know, the knock on effect of, you know, kind of years of sitting too much. We fundamentally are not supposed to sit. And during COVID, we've sat in kind of, you know, bad chairs, bad desks, the works. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I think it's picking up on everybody's points is it's the changing of our bodies. And if we embrace it, we make it normal, we make it conversational. 
And we, you know, look at, you know, what else can be added rather than thinking that you're kind of having things to take around because the world is a beautiful place. And we as women have superpowers to support each other through that journey, too. Cool. I'm going to come back to that point about added. That's really, uh, yeah, caught in my mind. So remind me to come back to that before the end. Jesse, yeah? Yeah, just picking up on, again, on what Mel said, it's, you know, adapting the type of recycling as well. You can do, um, obviously, I try not to use too much sciencey language, but um, sort of long endurance ex exercises, quite catabolic on the muscles. So uh, to do resistance training, to strengthen your muscles, which will also help with vasomotor uh, symptoms as well, resistance training. So the hot flushes and stuff that can really help doing resistance training. And obviously, as we get older, sort of our um, muscles start to get smaller. So resistance training uh, to complement your cycling, I'm not saying give up cycling, but to complement your cycling will become more important for as well as for your joints and your bones. So it's about training, really making your training a lot smarter rather than harder. Mm -hmm. So to support that sort of cycling. Yeah. And what do you want to add on to that, Susie? Um, I was just going to say the one the, the way I often sort of describe it to women just generally regardless of whether they're very physically active or not is that estrogen when you're pre-menopause is really good at protecting your bones and your heart and blood vessels so women pre-menopause have very low levels of cardiovascular disease because of the estrogen but women are now going to lead at least a third of their life post menopause and so that decline in estrogen is going to have a knock-on effect on your heart blood vessels and bones so things that you can do before that happens um, in lifestyle and exercise and those sort of things to improve your bone density to improve your heart and blood vessel health is really, really important so that you can maximize your health into that post-menopause phase of your life. Thank you. And um, do you want to just stay on there and lead us into the final category of symptoms? Yeah, so I guess the final thing, um, well, the two, the two last things I spoke about, one was about vaginal symptoms. And I think that for me is a big, a big area that I think needs to be talked about more because actually vaginal symptoms in the menopause are actually really quite easily managed with quite simple things and that can be life-changing for some women um, but women often don't want to talk about it and then the other thing was to do with periods which I think maybe you've, you've done a session probably talking about period changes um, in, in relation to cycling before so maybe the vaginal symptoms that I think probably have a, a really big impact. Yeah, and relevant, you know, if we're spending hours on a saddle and picking out our chamois and our paddings and all those sorts of things, then yes, this is definitely the space to talk about it. Emily, let's talk vaginas. <laughs> um, just moving on from what Susie said, there's a really good book that um, anybody who is having these vaginal um, issues, honestly, and even if you aren't, read it. If you're coming into perimenopause or menopause, there's a book called Me and My Menopausal Vagina by a lady called Jane Lewis. And once you've read that, then you understand what might be coming and then you know when to go and speak to the doctor and all the rest. And I was just going to quickly say about the um, aches and pains, it may be that you need to have a, a new bike fit at this point because you may not be able to be in your full on road bike position because your body might just not want to be like that any longer. So you might need to just slightly alter the um, geometry of your bike. Great. And did anybody else find that they had to make changes like that, geometry changes or yeah, that sort of thing? Leslie? Yeah, what I found was um, sort of, you know, getting ready to go to Africa and sort of planning what sort of bike I was going to use. I found that um, I was thinking I'd only be able to take two sets of clothes, one on, one off. And how is I going to wash my shorts every day and stuff like that? And reading around it appeared these brook saddles which are made of leather they kind of mold to your own sort of shape and it was amazing after about three weeks of cycling I then found I could just cycle in everyday knickers and I was really very comfortable so I, all that problem with pads and chamois disappeared <laughs> because wow. I had a better fitting saddle yeah so that was you know, and I'd never dream of getting one of these saddles you know in my previous life <laughs> um, but really made a superb difference to um you know comfort and practicality and you know all the other things that I had suffered previously yeah 
Awesome. And I've just, uh, anybody listening to this, we've got a link to Me and My Menopausal Vagina by Jane Lewis in the comments. So go and check that out if it's of interest to you. Um, so we're getting short on time. We've got about five minutes left. And I want to talk about diet, um, HRT, and get some questions answered and hear some of your incredible stories. So we might overrun a bit. So Leslie, if you need to go at, at the time, then that's fine. Um, so uh, where should we start? Should we start with diet? Because that seems to keep coming up amongst you. Like it's obviously had a big impact on things to learn. So who wants to talk about menopause, diet and cycling, I suppose, packing, you know, if you know that you've got a long ride ahead of you, what do you need to know? Everybody, I'm like, oh, you all want to talk about it, and now no one does. Go on, Jesse. No, I guess it depends on uh, what exactly uh, you want to know. <laughs> in terms of, you know, things don't need to change a huge amount. Um, in terms of uh, cycling uh, compared to before, um, uh, there are um, foods which could kind of exacerbate things like hot flushes. Um, if, for example, uh, before you used caffeine quite a lot for fueling, that may uh, not be help something that may not be that helpful. Um, obviously, having alcohol, things like that, probably uh, not that helpful either. Uh, I think the problem just generally is that most people uh, don't have grasp of what a basic diet should look like. Um, so uh, and things uh, not uh, you know including protein complex carbs fats um plenty of you know uh, fruit and vegetables you know just the general basics and hydrating well sleeping well all of these things people just general population don't have a grasp of that over anything else and, and that, this is what i see so many times with people that i work with is that uh, they start over exercising, uh, under uh, over dieting, which then puts more stress on the body, um, because they see themselves as putting on weight and unable or not having enough energy. Uh, you know, it's really about addressing those basics first before anything else. Cool. So uh, everyone uh, got their hands up now. Let Mel, you. I think you had your hand up first, and Emily will come to you so you can relax. Relax your hand if you want. I guess I'll just pick up on two of the things, you know, myself and Jesse and my co-founder Holly have worked on this whole fueling piece for probably now shy on three months. And picking up on Jesse's point is there's the, every woman at no matter what their age is, the utter importance to understand the basics around nutrition, because a lot of people tend to get that wrong from the embryonic stage. Is the second, second is journaling and tracking, because I know what affects me, but it will be very different to Emily, Susie, or you know many people on here. So there's not a route for everybody. There's your route, and I've said you know alcohol. I mean, mine are very you know stereotypical ones, um, and make those changes because if you want to continue to kind of flourish through the rest of your life, you can by back to Jesse's point simple things but get the basics right and grow from that because you'll still be as phenomenal as you were when you're in your 20s okay so i'm going to ask you in a sec what those basics are but i just want to hear from emily to know that you've been waiting patiently there um so i was going to say very similar to what mel said about tracking and not just tracking i mean when we sort of um a lot of us, when we come into perimenopause, find that our body shape changes. And so we maybe start trying to track our calories and trying to sort of control what's happening. And so when I'm talking about tracking, I'm talking about tracking your symptoms and tracking what you've eaten and, and what you've done and seeing how there's a correlation between them. So let's say, um, personally, I know if I drink red wine, if I drink any red wine, I do not sleep and I feel appalling. Now, funnily enough, it's been quite easy to stop drinking red wine because I've seen the link and I don't want to feel like that. I'm the same with caffeine. I've seen the link. I don't want to feel like that. Fine. But because um, because there's such a lot of stuff societally around us that we should be a certain size and we should we sort of get caught up in this whole sort of diet mentality rather than a nutrition and fuel mentality. And so we lose track on actually listening to what our body is telling us. So when we get back into tracking our symptoms and seeing what in our personal little world 
is making an impact, that is where we can start to make the changes. Yes, we need to understand about what nutrition is and all the rest of it. But actually, when we start from a place of what is triggering our symptoms, that's when we really can have a huge power to change things for ourselves rather than just taking a one size fits all. Thank you. Cool. Leslie, I'm just watching the clock here and I know that you've got things that you need to shoot off for. So I just wondered if I wanted to give you the floor for a minute or two just to talk about any any of your experiences that you feel that you haven't covered yet today that you think would be useful to the audience and maybe a little bit more interesting stuff about your trip cycling around the world so we can inspire the audience about life after menopause as well. Oh, that's a, a tall order to fit in all that amount so, of such a short Sorry, time. sorry, you got yeah. so much want to hear from you, um, but I know that you've got to rush. I agree with, with everything, you know, it, it's all about the individual and everyone's different. And it's really important that you listen to your body and do exactly what it is that you need to do. Um, and for me, um, I mean, I'm 59 now, but it was, uh, I think, four years ago that I set off for uh, to see how far I could go on my bike. Um, and 20 months later, I was in Uganda, um, and I never thought I would get that far <laughs> with a tent <laughs> and only three, three nights in uh, accommodation in that whole journey. All, all the time, the rest of the time was in a tent and obviously in some very wild and remote places. But, um, you know, what a privilege. I had my last period in, in Ethiopia. I can remember it clearly. <laughs> um, and then that was it. It was all done with. But certainly... I experienced the hot flashes and being in a hot climate, you know, was tough at times. But what I wanted to do was greater than um, my sufferings would allow me to perceive. So, um, yeah, great that you brought all this up today, Anna. It's uh, something that we all need to be mindful of. And uh, but, you know, don't fear it. It's something that, you know, we become older and wiser. And, uh, you know, it's it's not all bad news. <laughs> <laughs> great thank you all right leslie well i'll let you go if the others are still thank happy you. to stay on for a bye few everyone. more minutes bye bye. thank you so much for your time today leslie see you later bye right, cool all right i still see some hands have been going up because everyone wants to keep talking about that so who who did i just see with a hand up a second ago um yes jesse so yeah, well, um, just going back to what Emily was saying about tracking and what foods um, work for you and what foods don't, just adding on there, um, I, I like to look at it as well from a health perspective in that obviously perimenopause is the start and what we've got to look at is the bigger picture um, in looking at what we can do to protect our bodies for the rest of our lives. So that does mean, you know, eating a sufficient amounts of protein you know eating um having those having foods that are going to protect our health not just not just symptoms this is why i again always talk about not sp specific foods yeah for definitely for symptoms but in terms of protecting our bones our muscles our fat free like our fat free mass you know um you know our, our whole health as a whole we do need to focus on Get, getting you know those sort of you know an 80 20 kind of approach to what we eat whole foods plenty of protein vitamin d you know the whole the whole lot needs to be kind of addressed for for long term and just changing habits you know one at a time so that we're we've got a sustainable long-term approach with the foods that we eat that are going to support us forever um I'm inspired. And I'm not just saying that. It's not just a, a throwaway phrase. I'm like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Start tracking all this stuff and writing it down. Brilliant. Yeah, Mel, go on. Yeah, just picking up on Jesse's point around food groups. So, you know, one of the symptoms that I had was real muscle loss. So from somebody who was a swimmer, I was mortified because I love my big, strong, powerful kind of shoulders and, and I couldn't do enough. I was like, where's it going? And with that, then came loss of interest and kind of power to do the activity that I did. I think for me, lockdown has been hugely um, significant because I've now got back into doing a lot more strength work, which is so simple. And we have a great strength coach, Mel Young, who does two live sessions and anybody can come and join that. But the diet point is, you know, Jesse banging home about protein where I knew, but I was in complete denial because it's just like, oh, I can't be, you know, don't, I can't be bothered to go and do that. But the simplicity, you know, like Jesse, of simple understanding. So 
I have my veggie kind of uh, a vegan kind of scoops into my protein balls, which I love with with cocoa powder because I've got Raynars and I'm trying to kind of do that. And then on pancakes because it's like great because it's like, you know, it, it's free, you know, natural kind of stuff. And I've never been stronger. I've never been healthier. And I don't have the issues around muscle atrophy that I used to by changing those simple things. Cool. And um, before I'd like to talk about HRT as well, because I know that that can be a very conflicting issue. Uh, people are scared to get onto it young where um, there's a lot of myths or perhaps evidence I'm not entirely sure about the potential dangers of using hormone replacement therapy and how it affects different people I think people try and avoid it for quite a long time so Susie I'm going to go to you on and starting the topic about um, HRT yeah sure so I mean I'm actually a very strong advocate for HRT and I think sadly it gets a lot of negative press in the media and um, you know the media love um, a, a a horror story about things really don't they they don't often talk about the benefits of hrt um for me hrt i mean i i'm not personally going through the menopause but i've i've treated lots and lots of women who are and hrt really is the treatment that is going to make the most difference so if you are troubled by symptoms and they are affecting you significantly yes there are other things that you can try and i would always encourage people to to think about other things that, that are going to help but if you are really troubled by them then hrt is by far the most effective treatment for treating all of the symptoms so yes it's really good for managing the hot flushes but also it will improve all the psychological psychological symptoms and all the other physical symptoms that you get along with it. Um, I think there are lots of myths and untruths that are, are floating around about HRT. Um, I think the biggest one is to do with breast cancer. I think that's often badly portrayed in the media. Um, there is a slight increased risk of breast cancer when you use combined forms of HRT. But it's no worse than drinking. Well, actually, it's not even as bad as someone drinking two units of alcohol a night. So somebody who drinks regularly two units of alcohol has a higher risk of breast cancer than someone using combined HRT. And then even more worrying is to do with obesity. So women who have a BMI of more than 30 have a vastly higher risk of developing breast cancer than, than women using HRT. So for me, it's all about putting it in perspective with other lifestyle things that a lot of women probably do without necessarily even thinking about it. And also weighing up the risks and benefits. So often people don't talk about the other health benefits that you get from HRT. HRT protects your heart and your bones. It essentially um, keeps you in that kind of much healthier state for, for longer. And like we were saying earlier, that women are gonna lead a long part of their life post-menopause. If we can boost those elements earlier, it gives you a much better baseline to work forward from as you, as you do get older. But those, those sort of things don't make it into the media. Um, and interestingly, if you look at the mortality data for women generally, women who use HRT actually have lower mortality rates than those who don't, which is is quite fascinating and um, there's lots of really fascinating data that's really positive for hrt obviously i can't go into great detail in the time we've got today but um for me hrt should never be declined to anybody um women are never too young to start it and potentially even never too old it's always about weighing up the risks and benefits um, and it should be a very individualized discussion um, and I think, um, unfortunately, women are often told you can't have HRT, which I would say 99% of the time is probably not correct. Um, so I guess anyone who'd like to find out more about this could get in touch with you at the Cambridge yeah, Women's definitely. Health Clinic. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Good. Jessie? Yeah, I mean, in my line of work, I get a lot of questions about uh, about not obviously if someone talks to me about HRT that but I um I would always say first line of treatment it would be kind of that direction and take your symptoms to the doctor but I get so many questions about sort of alternatives and I just you know going just going back to what Susie was saying like a lot of the alternatives out there from what I understand um because then it's not a regulated industry lots of people go on to Amazon and buy sort of things that they think is a going to be helpful to them um, I would just urge people to kind of do their due diligence about 
the alternatives, I'm not saying that the alternatives are bad, is just do your, as with any supplement, because supplements aren't regulated, is to do your due diligence about what you're choosing, where you're choosing from, do your research, be very rigorous in that, um, and discuss it with your doctor, because some of the things that, like I think black cohosh is one where liver problems have been associated with it, uh, is talk to your doctor, see if there's any issues with existing medication that you're taking or conditions that you have. It's just, it's so important. Cool. Okay, we'll come to both of you, Mel and Emily. So Mel, do you want to go first? Yeah, just on the HRT, I mean, it definitely was a scaremongering. And for somebody that had the issues that I had that, you know, being quite open, I went to my doctor and they went, did a HRT? And I went, oh, my God, no, because I'm going to, you know, have. But I took it and I'm happy to say that I took it and, and it helped. What also helped me to know was I could I wanted to come off it. So I have stopped taking HRT after a short kind of period of time. And one of the things that has re really helped me to complement and understanding me better, we, for example, partner with Medichex and we've designed a specific product called a mind body fuel test. So one of my underlying issues with fatigue was low in iron, low in vitamin B12. Um, and I then went, mm, OK, so I can eat more nutrient rich iron foods. I've taken a supplement to be able to kind of help that. And I ultimately are now informed so. And the last point was around there is a multitude of them. Gone are the days where it's just a pill. You can have a variety. And I know there's a comment from someone is, look, you know, it, it's not what it used to be. And it is something that can significantly help you be so much better about yourself. Great. And Emily. I just wanted to say, um, sort of following on from what Mel said, really, um a there are lots and lots of different types of um hrt so the initial one you try may not be right for you but don't assume that that means that all hrts are bad for you it's like if you go if you go to the doctor for anti um antibiotics and you get a reaction you wouldn't say i can't take any antibiotic because i had that one and it was bad but people seem to lump hrt into being this one thing and that's just simply not the case um sorry one of my dogs is growling at the others and I don't know why um and then um another thing I wanted to say is that there seems to be this perception and I see this a lot in the Facebook group for the perimenopause hub that having HRT is somehow giving in as though somehow that means that we've failed as a human being which just simply isn't the case what we're doing is replenishing what our body needs right now to keep it safe and to keep it strong so it isn't a giving in at all. It's it's if you need that medication, you need that medication. There's no there's no wrong about it. There's nothing moral about taking it. It's yeah. just if that's what you need, that's what you need. Um, and lastly, I'll stop talking in a second. Um, I think sometimes um, women think that by the time they've gone to the point of wanting to ask, ask for HRT, so they've got to the point of feeling so utterly awful that they feel there's no light at the end of the tunnel and so they finally give in and go to their doctor and then expect an immediate everything's better but actually those lifestyle changes that perimenopause and menopause is encouraging us to make we still need to be looking at yes hrt will make us feel better when we find the right one for us but actually we do still need to look at what alcohol we're drinking what foods that we're having that are triggering things what exercise we're doing is that supporting us or actually is that making us feel worse those things don't just magically go away with hrt so it's it's an it's an all-round kind of holistic approach that we need to be taking thank you all right so as we wrap this up i'm going to ask you guys to look on the live comments in your stream um and pick out a comment that you would like to reply to whether it's a question or just something that um you'd like to highlight so if you'd like to pick out then we'll go through individually and one last question from me I'm just thinking about sort of this as a taboo topic and the cycling community in general and how um, and maybe you especially Emily because you you're trying to still compete in triathlons how much of this is a topic that you could address within the cycling community you know your friends perhaps a cycling club um, and it's still quite a male dominated world so is it you know as you were going through this did you feel like 
within our world, you could find answers and conversations there. So um, this is just a random little anecdote for you. I was out cycling because I also work as a PT as well as running the hub. I was out cycling with a client last summer and we were, and I was telling him all about the hub and he was, oh, what's this thing you've been working on? I gather you're working on something. Da, da, da. I said, oh, yes, it's um, it's a website bringing together experts to help women going through all of this. And he's like, so what actually is it? And we spent a happy hour cycling with me just explaining what it was. By the end, he's like, my other half so badly needs you in her life. <laughs> and, and it's just not being embarrassed to talk about it. We aren't embarrassed to talk about puberty when teenagers go through it, but somehow we get embarrassed to talk about the reverse of it. And, and it's not embarrassing. It's just life. Yeah, just happening. Excellent. Look, well, we are wrapping up with time. We've hit the hour. So if you guys just want to pick your questions, uh, that you'd like to highlight. I'm sorry, we got it. So if you keep your thing now, we, people can contact you afterwards. So um, Susie, do you want to bring up a question or a comment that caught your eye? Yeah, so there was a lady who's spoken about having some vaginal prolapse symptoms that's been really affecting her ability to cycle. Um, and I think I just, I thought this would just be a good opportunity to talk about the vaginal symptoms that I was discussing before. And I know I spoke about HRT, but if, if it is just the vaginal symptoms that you're struggling with, there is actually an HRT formulation that you can use just in the vagina, which is really, really effective. Um, so it comes in a few different forms. There are little tablets that you can insert. There's a ring that you can put in, and there's also a cream you can use. But these are really... The, the vagina responds really well to this form of estrogen replacement and it's really really safe to use so if you've got anxiety a little bit about wanting to go down a full hrt route but you are struggling with the vaginal symptoms have a chat with your doctor about about those products because they're super safe in fact if you use them every day for a year you get the equivalent dose of one tablet of hrt so you, you absorb very little of the estrogen into your body so if you're keen for avoiding systemic HRT but the vaginal symptoms are really bad that I would strongly encourage you to, to think about using those. Great thank you I'm just um, letting producer Nick know about that comment so we can just get it on the screen because I do think that's a really important Great. one and one that people find yeah. hard to bring up so I'm really glad that uh, someone's had the courage to do that for the benefit of everybody else as well. Um, so Je uh, Jesse, yeah do you want to go next? So there's a comment here from a lady called Diane Jago. She's talking about prolapse um, and she's been told that it's probably come on as a product of hormones declining um, and it's in, in, sort of impacting her cycling. Um, I would say go to a women's physio, get some specific um, uh, sort of examinations done. Um, you may need to work on strengthening pelvic floor. Um, so yeah, you know, obviously, if things are discomfort, if there's discomfort, uh, you need to, you really need to get that looked at, especially if there's a prolapse. So, women's health physio would be my first. But you can get in contact with those either through, um, like, there's specialists or personal trainers out there that, pers that um, can uh, have probably got a network of one that you can go to, or your GP is put, um, might be able to put you in touch with with one although there are often um waiting lists but you don't need to let it stop your life you probably just have to hang back a little bit work on it and just you know it shouldn't stop you from cycling in the long right. term yeah uh mel which comment have you picked out yeah it's just not necessarily a comment but it's a theme that we talked a lot around is product and you know cycling kit so we are at the real embryonic stage of developing a cycle line working with our partners hoob so if there's any women that want to get in touch in terms of you know kind of feedback kind of thoughts i would love us to then kind of champion this piece to again make product more accessible for women kind of going through that and understanding what, you know, they feel that would like, that's kind of my background in terms of kind of product development. I want to make a product that is really usable um, for women. So if anybody has any views, then you know, look, get in touch. We'd love to, you know, them to be part of the development of this. Okay, cool. And Emily, what uh, comment or question have you got there? Um, I've, there's a comment um, 
linking back to what I was saying age, um, earlier about not chasing times and distance, but just going and enjoying your activity. And the same lady says that she's noticed that she's putting on quite a lot of weight at the moment, um, despite doing the same amount, the usual exercise and the same and eating the same. And this is something that I hear probably every single day um, is people, is women saying, what on earth is happening? My body's changing and I'm, I haven't changed. I, I, and then they start to restrict their calories because they feel like they need to be fighting against their body because if I'm gaining weight, then that must be somehow bad and therefore I must restrict. When actually, without going into a very long drawn out comment about this, but basically during um, perimenopause and menopause, we potentially start to gain weight or to hold fat, sorry, use the correct terminology, um, around our bellies. And that is our body trying to hold on to some estrogen. So it's actually your body trying to protect you from the dangers of osteoporosis and heart disease in the future. So if we then try to fight that and try to restrict calories and try to um, sort of punish ourselves for the fact that our body has changed shape, we're actually double fighting it. So much as it takes a huge leap of faith to go the other way, and do, as Jesse was saying, and really overhaul what you eat and look at what you're having, but not from a point of restriction, from a point of nourishment. Um, that makes such a huge difference. And the more we can work with our bodies rather than fighting against them, the sooner we come out of this feeling stronger and better. Cool. All right. Well, we've gone over time now, but thank you so much. This has been absolutely fascinating. And we're still getting questions in. So if you, your own time, fancy going through any of the comments and and letting people know that they can get in touch with you, that that will be fine as well. You know, and any of the audience that still feel that they'd like their questions answered, feel free to get in touch, make a note of our guests' um, names and have a Google of them and get in touch with them after this. And thank you everybody so much for all your input today, your stories and your expertise. It's been fantastic. And your openness as well for talking about this. Hopefully it's given um, a lot more insight into the world of cycling and menopause and beyond. So uh, we're gonna be back with Bantz Bikes and being female next week. Until then, thanks everybody and I'll see you then. Bye. Well,